this talk was kind of inspired by like the last four months of this economic governance um, almost phenomena that happened in the Filecoin network. Um, so uh, it's not actually going to go too deeply into the details of what that specific um, incident or if not incident, but uh, uh, process was. Um, we'll touch on it briefly as like a case study example. Um, but I think what I want what, what what I want to do here is talk a little bit about like the kind of underlying issues that presented itself on a more holistic or, or deeper level. So not necessarily the economic trade-offs that happened with this specific, let's say, policy change that some that was being debated about being included in the Filecoin network, um, but more about how do we think about economic trade-offs in general writ large in these open, decentralized, permissionless, you know, blockchain spaces. Um, so I think uh, this, this talk is situated in the context of the Filecoin economy and, and, and the Filecoin network, but is, can be like generalizable to any, any open, permissionless, uh, like blockchain network when it comes to uh, kind of analyzing econ uh, governance or, or policy changes from, a, from an economic lens. Um, so I think to start, like, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about what, you know, what, how do crypto economics and, and blockchain governance kind of fit together? And, and I think they, they intimately overlap um, because as we are both, in, in Crypto Econ Lab, we are both researchers and practitioners. And to me, what that means is it matters to, to do research and matters to have, you know, kind of theorize and, and have like a vision of what our world ought to look like, or in this smaller example, what our network or protocol ought to look like from an economic perspective. Um, but that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that much unless something is implemented and practiced or realized. And when you ask a question about how can something be implemented in practice or, or realized, that then becomes a kind of a governance question. So um, this, this graphic kind of illustrates all the different fields that contribute to what it means to be a crypto economist. And I think the part that, how, how can I be mobile? Um, the, the part that I want, oh, I have a laser. Um, the part that I think we can talk about in, in this talk is this part, the, the, like the poli political science and, and governance part. So, um, you know, with that in mind, uh, let's I want to set the stage a little bit to introduce the concept of Filecoin as this, this island economy. So um, this has been done uh, in many ways to explain the crypto economics and the tokenomics of Filecoin. I think we can also do the, use, use this to explain the governance portion, but um, to take a step back, like what is Filecoin? Uh, at the core of it, Filecoin is an island economy, but island economy that exports a certain good uh, or goods. Um, and in my view, these are storage and storage related services. So part of what Filecoin is exporting is, yes, raw storage capacity, um, yes, archival cold storage capabilities, but it's also exporting the composable usage of things like compute, retrieval, uh, and the, uh, the, mod the modular nature of how you can combine all of, all of these things um, into this like truly trustless open, open system or, or open services for data. Um, so that is what we are doing. And then the next thing is who comprises or what comprises this island economy. And I think it's this diverse you know, collection of researchers, um, many of whom you've been hearing from today. Uh, it's token holders because the, the token is what allows you, it's a, the, the Filecoin is a utility token that allows you to interact with all these different services. Uh, it is storage providers um, who are offering up their hardware, their resources, um, and, and their time to store data. And it's the developers and ecosystem partners that are building on top of the IPFS and Filecoin stack. Then, uh, but the, 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 way, the way an island economy works though is it's not completely insular in that everything that happens within the economy isn't just uh, limited to its borders. It also touches the outside world. So Filecoin touches other cryptocurrencies. It, it can touch things like Ethereum. It can touch things like Solana, et cetera. Um, and this will become even more apparent when you have F or you know, the Falcon virtual machine that comes out uh, next, you know, that will be rolled out next, next, next year. Uh, but 
uh, it, can, it does much more than that even. It can also touch things like Web2. Like if we want to be, more, be the decentralized infrastructure, st infrastructure stack, not just for Web3, but for, for the world, then you can imagine this island economy touches things like uh, 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 gaming and, and content delivery and, and video streaming, et cetera, um, in, in worlds that are entirely removed from, from, from cryptocurrencies and, and Web3. Uh, and the reason I, I bring this up is that also means this is an open economy that has open governance associated with it. So in a similar way that anybody can be a part of this economy, anybody can be a token holder, anybody can be a storage provider, um, anybody can be a developer, that also means anybody can participate in economic governance, which is a unique twist to like how things happen in, in Web3. Uh, and it presents its challenges, which I think um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of delve into deeper. Um, so, I, I think um, when we think about economic governance, a lot, of, a lot of the ways we think about it is, okay, you have all of these different economic trade-offs between all these different groups. Um, there are economic trade-offs. When I say trade-offs, I mean when you have an economic policy or when you have economic parameters or, 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 or decision, you know, or, 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 or uh, let's say, um, like parameter spaces or, or, or trade-offs, what, you, what you're considering is economic trade-offs between certain groups like clients, storage providers, ecosystem partners, token holders, and, and, and developers. The interesting thing about, to, uh, about, uh, about economics is that not all policies affect all groups equally, and some might benefit at the expense of others. Um, and then what you're kind of trying to do as an economist is balance out all the different interests of these stakeholder groups. Um, but I think there's one more thing to add, um, which is, the idea of the network being a stakeholder group. Um, and what I mean by that is the, the protocol itself also has interests. The protocol itself also um, withstands the brunt or the impact of some economic trade-offs. But the interesting thing is the, pro the protocol itself is not an explicit stakeholder group and therefore it doesn't have its own, its own voice. Um, so, 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 so what I'm trying to really articulate here is uh, the, the little math notation here, all that is trying to say is the network is not just the composable sum, linear sum of all of the individual parts. It's much more than that. Like similar to like in crypto, when uh, you know, uh, the, the whole composability thing is that uh, you can take uh, the sum of, the, the whole is greater than the, the sum of all of its parts. I think I, I kind of want to argue that the, the network is greater than the sum of all these individual components because the network cares about, you know, it's, it's, it's like its stakeholders now for sure, but also it cares about all, but also it cares about all this other, uh, all these other people. The, the network cares about the people who are a part of it now, but also the people that could be a part of it in the future. Um, the network cares about its potential clients. Like the network should also care about who else will be contributing to this pie, because at the end of the day, if Falcon wants to be uh, a decentralized, uh, foundation for humanity's information, this pie needs to continue growing. We are very far from getting to that vision, right? So as a, as a stakeholder, that is what the network might value much higher above, let's say, the individual interests of a specific client or storage, storage provider or, or developer. So that also means, I think, that the network's voice must be very highly valued when we make economic decisions. Uh, and when we look at the, like, uh, questions of economic governance. So when we go from the bottom-up model of, you know, we make economic policies and we try to balance out the viewpoints of the clients and storage providers and developers and token holders and ecosystem partners, et cetera, that's all very good, but there's a sixth voice or sixth uh, you know, thing that we need to balance out as well, which is the interest of the network um, and the interest of uh, the economic interest of growing this, this, this kind of pie. Um, and the reason I think that is because this island economy that we're, we're creating is, is quite literally what sustains and allows for the actions of all those individual stakeholder groups. Anyone contributing to Filecoin and building on the IPF and, and building on the Filecoin stack is implicitly um, and, and, and greatly like contributing to the island economy, but also being sustained by it. So when we when we you know look 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 towards economic policy, uh, I think if if the network would speak. Uh, it should be a very loud voice, but unfortunately, um, it doesn't have one. So then, that brings me to like 
Um, and, and oh, so, so, and I think like uh, to, to kind of illustrate the earlier point about how, how powerful uh, this island economy is and, and the underlying tokenomics, um, I think this graph is the easiest one to, to kind of explain it because uh, in, in case you didn't know, Filecoin recently celebrated its, its second birthday. We are two years old. Um, and yeah, and we are a very, very large, like we are entering our, what is it, our terrible twos. Um, and we are a pretty large two-year-old, you know? Um, like it, the, the, the network is at about like 16 ebibytes, uh, over 16 exabytes of uh, committed storage capacity. Um, that is massive. It took uh, Google or uh, Amazon orders of magnitude of time longer to get to that same point. And then the question like you have is, is why did, why did we do it so, so much faster? And a lot of it is based, is, is the economics and the tokenomics that underlie how uh, you can create sustainable scalability and, and value creation uh, via, via this you know, decentralized open network where anybody can contribute their resources. So I think this illustrates a little bit about like how the Allen economy sustains all like, sustains all of us, um, and also how we should, you know, uh, place a lot of credence on making sure that the island economy continues to still have the economic parameters um, designed to to enable that 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 value creation to continue. So that you know, I've talked a lot about how the network is this mute like omniscient kind of thing. Um, and then, so then the question is like, who's, who speaks for the, the network? Um, and who can safeguard the, safeguard the economics, you know, the network's economic interests? Um, some might say, is it protocol labs? Um, maybe. Is it the Falcon Foundation? Like potentially in part. Is it Crypto Econ Lab? Is it network? Is it me? Am I the network? Um, no. But I, I think the answer is that um, when it comes to economic governance and open and open and open systems and open like decentralized uh, uh, networks, I think all of us uh, have to be prepared to weight the economic interests of the network um, in our decision making processes because there is no centralized body to take on the position of being an economic like, safeguarder. There is no Federal Reserve, right? There is no body that has the ability to solely care about the economic viability um, and the economic uh, safety of the, the economy. Um, and that is, I hope, a feature and not a bug of decentralized and open, like, you know, uh, and, and open networks. Um, do I think we should have a Federal Reserve that dictates economic policy uh, in, in Filecoin? Um, I think that would be antithetical to a lot of the ethos of, of Web3. But then that also introduced its own challenges. Uh, it introduces its own challenges. Ah, so this is the, the part where we talk about FIB 36. So uh, I, I, I alluded a little bit earlier to like this, this four month process that was very interesting um, in the Filecoin ecosystem, which was uh, this, this uh, improvement proposal that introduced a lot of economic changes to the, the, the Falcon ecosystem. Um, for some shared context, a FIP is similar to an EIP, um, which is a Falcon, and it stands for a Falcon Improvement Proposal. And this, uh, FIP, all FIPs introduce some kind of protocol change uh, to the Falcon network. And in order to be accepted, the general process is they, is they achieve some kind of like nebulous soft consensus approach where there's general agreement, or maybe a better term is general lack of disagreement. Um, uh, and then a, a FIP is, is introduced and, and, and introduced into the protocol um, and sub in network upgrades. FIP 36 was an was a, uh, a economic change, which at the core, I'm not really going to go into whether or not I think FIP 36 is good or bad or the case for or against, but I think the takeaway is FIP 36 introduced a lot of economic trade-offs. Introduced trade-offs for storage providers. It introduced trade-offs for um, deal clients or you know, people looking to store deals. Um, it introduced a trade-offs for, for token holders and, and, ver and, and various different ecosystem you know, partners. Um, and the, the, the idea is you have these like, different levers and you had this thing that you wanted to uh, 
like this uh, parameter that you were kind, kind of trying to uh, affect with all these different levers, and one of those was the percentage of supply locked. Like this, this like little diagram isn't uh, wholly encapsulating all of the levers and all of the things that were trying to be done with Fit36, but it, this, is an, you know, this is an example of it. Um, and I think what uh, inspired like this, this talk was this idea that uh, you have all these rational agents in, in Filecoin that uh, are primarily speaking from their position of self-interest when it comes to economic policies. And that's very, very good, right? Like, you, you, it would be kind of hard to have crypto economic systems when your agents or actors who are participating aren't rational agents. Because um, then how would you model um, a system? Like, the, the base assumption in a lot of economics is that you have utility maximizing actors who are looking to maximize their expected payoff. Um, and people did just that when it came to FIP36. Like, many people spoke from that position. They spoke from the position of, how do I, like, why, how does this policy affect my expected payoff? Um, and therefore, how does that impact my, like, perception or whether or not I think this is a, something that I would support? Um, and I don't fault anybody for that. I think that's great. That makes me very happy that we have a network of rational actors. But I think there's, like, one more thing I'd want to add, though, which is um, if you weight your, like, is, is yes, weight your own self-interest very, very, very importantly, but keeping in mind that we have no Federal Reserve and we have no voice for the, for the network, we all have to include at least some part of the network's interest in our own decision-making. Um, keep Because if we look back, like the network, again, is, is, what, is what sustains us and allows us to continue growing this economy. Um, and I call that winning the long game, which is, it will take a long time to get to the vision that we are trying to achieve when it comes to Falcon. It will take many more developers, it will take many more storage providers, it will take a lot more tooling, it will take all the things you have heard from people like Maria in retrie retrieval markets and um, the impact evaluator talk that we just, we just happened. All, all of that will, 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 have, to, will have to happen. Um, and that might be, there might, and there will be more FIP36 after this. Like, this wasn't a one-off thing, there will be more cases where uh, economic trade-offs will be hard and the rational instinct, the, the natural instinct will be to be your, exercise your um, own hyper-rationality and self-interest as, as an agent in this economy. Um, I, I, I think my only one takeaway is, um, let's think about the network too a little bit. Um, because uh, as we move on for like more, like longer and longer into the future, uh, it becomes even more important to have robust economic tooling uh, to create economic you know, policy for this network to grow, and the stakes only become higher as the network becomes bigger. Uh, so, you know, I know we all want the, what's best for, for us, and I, and I don't blame anybody for that. I think that's, that's perfectly natural uh, in any uh, system full of, in, in, in any decentralized you know, network of, for, for, in which anybody can be a participant and leave whenever they want. Um, but, you know, if our vision is to be a uh, decentralized economy for open services on, on, on data, then the economic health of that network that sustains us uh, should be maybe a, 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 a paramount consideration uh, over time when it comes to economic policy making. Uh, so thank you. So one thing the Federal Reserve does that's fairly useful, I, I think, in tethering um, the function between risk and payoff, like the time value, value trade-off that's sort of fundamental for any financial market, um, is they set sort of the risk-free interest rate. Um, is there a decentralized way on the Filecoin network to set a decentralized uh, risk-free interest rate, or at least create some distribution between risk and payoff, um, especially when hedging risk of uh, unexpected behavior by Filecoin storage providers? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I think like there's a lot of work that's being done to quantify what might, you know, characterize this idea of a, a risk-free rate in, in blockchain in, in spaces that aren't fiat denominated. Um, I think when you have the ability to have more robust like DeFi protocols in, in Filecoin, something like this yield will like naturally kind of emerge. 
Um, and my suspicion is when we have things like the Falcon virtual, machi virtual machine, which will enable these DeFi markets to kind of, uh, kind of be built, um, you will see some uh, market equilibria yield curve kind of forming. Um, and that, that might inform this idea of a risk-free rate rather than you know, the FOMC coming out and uh, you know, adjusting their monet you know, adjusting monetary policy. Um, disclaimer, none of this is financial advice, so you should all do your own research. Um, these are, these, <laughs> these, this, this is just my, these are just my thoughts, but uh, that's my suspicion. Okay. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, so I'm just a bit curious about the decision to have like a general lack of disagreement as the main criteria for adopting a FIP or an IPIP. I mean, I know you're saying it's good not to have the Federal Reserve or these centralized systems that decide such things, but it seems like you're kind of asking people to do a lot in terms of the discussion of whether or not these things get approved. They have to take their own self-interest into account, the network interest. But really, from what I've seen, it's a lot of like just general GitHub discussions that can get very long, and it's kind of hard to track like what the general sense of agreement or disagreement is. So I was just curious if you could uh, speak a bit on how things actually get adopted and why that is. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So when I say like general lack of disagreement, um, basically what I mean to say is uh, because it's a completely open governance, technically everybody is a part of Falcon governance. Like technically every single person who in some way touches a Falcon ecosystem, which depending on how you slice that can be a humongous uh, stakeholder group is, is, is a part of, of, of Falcoin, which means that it would be kind of, an, it, it would probably cause a fair bit of policy paralysis if the criteria for governance meant explicit agreement from all these groups, um, which is why I say uh, there is soft consensus includes this idea of if you if you didn't care, then then you're okay with it kind of, kind of idea. Um, was it, there was a second part to your question, I think, a little bit about, uh, but and if you want, could you repeat that, or did that answer most of it? Um, I want to make sure I answer exactly what you were asking. Yeah, I, I think you mostly answered it. It just, it seems, uh, I'm still a little bit confused about, um, like, if you have some hundreds of GitHub comments on a, a FIP uh, discussion, like, how do you achieve consensus? Yeah. And, um, yeah. yeah. Got it, got it. Yeah, and so that's a trick. That's, that's the next, so this talk was about, like, how do we, value things or how do we come to, um, as rational agents, how do we include something that might be more, um, how do we fix maybe this kind of blockchain tragedy of the commons? Um, so that was like the nature of, of this talk. But the second question is, okay, when we have all this massive disagreement, how do we resolve this? Um, and the short answer is, I don't know. Um, like the short answer is we tried uh, polling methods, et cetera, in, in, in FIP36, FIP like at some point you're gonna have to come to a concrete decision. Um, and I think that maybe that could be my next talk, but um, the, the question of, of how to resolve uh, like the, the, a very disparate group of different stakeholders, et cetera, kind of uh, uh, disagreeing and fighting about something, uh, like that, you know, well, you can, you can look to how FIP36 did it. Do you think, if, do you think that's optimal? I, I, I'm not sure, I don't think so, uh, but it's, it's a starting point, and then we can always build better tooling as we, um, become more, more mature. Remember, we're, we're still in our terrible twos. Hey there, so it was a really nice talk, so thanks for that. Um, you mentioned that crypto economic systems are based on having rational agents who try to maximize their own utility, but then at the end you said that sometimes these agents should prioritize the health of the network over their own personal benefit. How do you think these agents can come to this trade-off in a non-biased manner, and do we require some more nuanced governance mechanisms to do so? Yeah, I, yeah so I think to, to kind of reframe the question, um, what, I, what I really mean to say here is as rational agents, it might be in your best interest to sacrifice your shorter term payoff for the uh, interest of the network writ large over time. Because if you're, because that's why I spent a lot of time kind of emphasizing the idea that the network itself is what sustains all of us as, as, as these agents. So if your actions and acting, if your actions are, or, sorry, if acting in your own self-interest kind of like, um, let's say is, is almost predatory on the network or predatory on the economic interest of the network, um, that short-term like payoff might be 
good, but if you're like a longer term agent who is more concerned with how their like their uh, their participation over time will yield them rewards, then um, you should care about the network as as this important stakeholder group um, when thinking about economic policies. Yeah, great. Thank you.